On the occasion of Aspen's 2018 Malnutrition Awareness Week, I would like to provide this short presentation on addressing malnutrition in hospitalized patients and the use of parental nutrition in adults. Hello, my name is Cindy Hamilton. I am the Senior Director of Nutrition for the Center for Human Nutrition within the Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute at the Cleveland Clinic, and I currently serve on the Aspen Board of Directors. There are three objectives in this presentation. First, to raise provider awareness about the prevalence and adverse consequences of malnutrition in hospitalized patients. Also, to present ways to improve the diagnosis and coding of malnutrition. And third, to describe the appropriate use of parental nutrition as an effective intervention for malnutrition in adult hospitalized patients. Estimating malnutrition is challenging because for four decades, researchers have defined malnutrition differently. Malnutrition is multifactorial and includes a variety of socioeconomic, iatrogenic, and disease-related causes. It is therefore not surprising that malnutrition is common among hospitalized patients. Its prevalence depends on the population studied and the criteria used to define malnutrition. Among patients who do not have malnutrition upon admission, it is estimated that one in three may become malnourished during their hospital stay. In essence, 20 to 50 percent of hospitalized patients are malnourished. A recent Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Statistical Brief reported that in 2013, there were 1.95 million hospital stays that involved malnutrition, representing 7.1% of the 27.6 million total non-maternal and non-neonatal stays, and 64% were categorized as protein calorie malnutrition. These numbers are considered underreported. Malnutrition affects clinical outcomes, including longer lengths of stay, an increased risk of infection and other complications, higher resource utilization and cost of care, a greater likelihood of readmissions, and higher rates of mortality. There are generally three different etiologies that drive malnutrition. One is starvation related. This is seen in chronic starvation or pure anorexia and typically involves only minimal inflammation. Chronic disease-related malnutrition is seen in those with organ failure, pancreatic cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, and obesity, for example. Inflammation is usually chronic and of mild to moderate degree. And the third etiology is acute illness or injury-related malnutrition. This is seen in those with major infections, burns, trauma, and closed head injury. Inflammation is acute and severe. Aspen and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics developed characteristics for the identification of malnutrition. And malnutrition is suspected if there are two or more characteristics. These include insufficient energy intake, unintentional weight loss, decreased muscle mass, decreased subcutaneous fat, fluid accumulation, and decreased functional status, often seen with hand grip strength. When assessing patients for malnutrition, we determine the potential etiology and utilize the characteristics. Patients are assessed as either moderately or severely malnourished. This table outlines the characteristics for moderate malnutrition. Weight loss and energy intake are categorized by percent change over time and by etiology. Note that body fat and muscle 
are of mild depletion with mild fluid accumulation. This table helps establish the diagnosis of severe malnutrition. Weight loss and energy intake are also categorized by percent change over time and by etiology. Note that body fat, muscle mass are described as moderate to severe depletion and fluid accumulation is moderate to severe. So why code for malnutrition? Malnutrition diagnosis codes can be used as either reportable, primary, or secondary diagnoses. A secondary diagnosis is when all conditions coexist at the time of admission or subsequently develop or affect the treatment during admission. Malnutrition is a reportable code for additional reimbursement. A DRG or a diagnostic related group with a comorbidity or complication can be classified as a CC or an MCC and is reimbursed at a higher rate. In other words, it shifts the relative weight of the assigned DRG. Malnutrition also impacts patient acuity and hospital performance. The metrics that may be impacted include the length of stay, the severity of illness, and the risk of mortality score, the mortality index, which is the actual divided by the expected mortality, and value-based purchasing. In order to receive reimbursement for malnutrition, specific provider documentation must be present in the patient's health record. Providers must document the diagnosis of malnutrition, including in the admission note, the progress note, and the discharge note. Documenting malnutrition on the problem list is not sufficient. Also, dietitian documentation cannot be used to code. It's still extremely important that the dietitian document their assessment of the patient and the plan for malnutrition. Malnutrition should be documented with supporting evidence throughout the hospitalization. And documentation should include interventions that are addressing the malnutrition. An important intervention for malnutrition may be the provision of parental nutrition. There are a few key points to remember. First, oral or enteral nutrition should be the first line intervention when possible. When oral or enteral nutrition is poorly tolerated or inappropriate, parental nutrition can provide optimal delivery of required nutrients. With the use of better central line insertion techniques and care, the risk of central line infections can be decreased. The use of lower calorie parental nutrition regimens and greater glycemic control also can decrease the risk of infection. Harvey and Heidegger are two helpful resources that support this topic and their full citations is at the end of the PowerPoint. So what is parental nutrition? This parental nutrition is re represented in a three-chamber bag and contains concentrated dextrose, amino acids with electrolytes, and intravenous lipids, all sealed in separate chambers. To prepare, the seals are broken, the formulation mixed together, and then components such as multivitamins and trace elements are added. Parental nutrition can also be compounded in a single bag and sometimes the lipids are infused separately. Parental nutrition is delivered via a central venous catheter on an infusion pump, usually over 24 hours. When determining the appropriate use of parental nutrition, begin by identifying clinical indications for parental nutrition, including manifestations of acute and chronic intestinal failure and recognize the situations in which parental nutrition is not likely to be a benefit to the patient. Initiate parental nutrition based on a gastrointestinal function, the nutritional status, 
and clinical status. Select the vascular access device best suited to the therapy plan. This may be a PIC, a tunnel catheter, or an implanted port. Also, implement measures to promote safety and reduce adverse outcomes. It is important to evaluate res the response to therapy and adjust the therapeutic plan based on ongoing monitoring. Assess the continued need for parental nutrition and always transition promptly to oral or enteral nutrition as soon as possible. Also important to always collaborate across disciplines. This slide outlines common conditions in which parental nutrition is required in adults, such as with impaired absorption or loss of nutrients in conditions such as short bowel syndrome, complications of bariatric surgery, mesenteric thrombosis, trauma, high output intestinal fistula, small bowel mucosal disease, such as radiation or chemotherapy related enteritis, also mechanical bowel obstruction, and the need to restrict oral or enteral intake, as in those requiring bowel rest due to ischemic bowel, severe pancreatitis, chylos fistula, or preoperatively with severely malnourished patients with non-functional gastrointestinal tracts for seven to 10 days prior to surgery. Motility disorders, as well as the failure to tolerate adequate oral intake or enteral nutrition, and the ability to achieve or maintain enteral access. It is important to have standardized clinical monitoring with parental nutrition to detect early complications and transition a patient off parental nutrition as soon as possible. This table outlines the parameters and frequency for most hospitalized patients. The parameters to follow include a physical examination, the evaluation of weight and height, to determine the energy and macronutrient needs and make adjustments as necessary, to evaluate the intake and output records, regularly review vital signs, especially important is blood glucose monitoring, the evaluation of micronutrient status, the examination of vascular access devices on a daily basis, and to reassess the continued need for parental nutrition. A frequent question of clinicians is what should parental nutrition be initiated? These guidelines are helpful and is recommended to initiate parental nutrition after seven days for well-nourished, stable adult patients who have been unable to receive significant oral or enteral nutrients. Parental nutrition can be initiated within three to five days and those who are nutritionally at risk and unlikely to achieve desired oral intake or enteral nutrition. Parental nutrition should be initiated as soon as possible for patients with baseline moderate or severe malnutrition in whom oral intake or enteral nutrition is not possible or sufficient. And last, parental nutrition should be delayed in a patient with severe metabolic instability until the patient's condition has improved. In conclusion, to this presentation, the early recognition and treatment of malnutrition are keys for improved patient outcomes and quality metrics. Providing appropriate parental nutrition intervention and strategies to malnourished patients may decrease complications and length of stay. Proper nutrition therapy and monitoring throughout hospitalization may improve readmission rates and prevent therapy-related complications. The remaining slides in this presentation provide the references for this presentation, an important acknowledgement and key details about Aspen. I thank you for your attention and hope you found this presentation helpful.